Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Abdurrahim Green. You're joining me for the proof that Islam is the truth. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the stories of those people who heard the Quran. The age of Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was a time when the Arabs were at the peak of the linguistic abilities. Indeed, one of the finest poems ever composed in the Arabic language was done at the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, by a man who was contemporaneous to the Prophet. His name was Labaid ibn Rabia. And his poem, when it was recited at the marketplace at Uhaz, caused the Arabs to prostrate before him in admiration. And when this same Labaid began to hear the verses of the Qur'an, he embraced Islam and gave up poetry altogether. When he was once asked to recite some poetry, he said, what? Poetry? After the Qur'an? Indeed, many of the Arabs entered Islam just from hearing the Qur'an because they knew that it was conclusive proof of its divine origin. They knew no man could produce the like of the Qur'an and its eloquence. You see, the challenge of the Qur'an was not to produce, as some people might suppose, a amazing piece of literature like Shakespeare or Shelley or Keats or Homer or any of these great literists. No. The challenge of the Qur'an was something much more fundamental. Because the Qur'an differed in its very structure. The very structure of the Qur'an was different from anything that had proceeded before it in the Arabic language. And you see, in the Arabic language, poetry falls into 16 different Bihar. The word Bihar means sea. Why? Because each poem moves according to a different rhythmic pattern and then of course they have the speech of the soothsayers and they have prose and they have rhymed prose and normal speech so these are the forms of the arabic language yet the quran although it seemed to reflect some of those forms it was none of them it was unique it was not like anything the arabs had ever heard before it did not fit into any of those categories yet at the same time it made sense, more than sense. It was the peak of eloquence. And this is what made the Qur'an inimitable. And so the Arabs, the pagan Arabs, who when they heard this message of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, the message that they should give up the worship of all the created things. They should not worship idols, they should not worship people, they should not worship each other, rather, they should pray to and worship only the one God. This was the message of Muhammad, and this was the message of all of the prophets. When they heard this message, many of them did not like what they were hearing. They started to rebel. Mostly the rich and the powerful people, because in their mind, it was challenging their self-interest. The Kaaba was the center of pilgrimage for all the people in Arabia. They used to come to the Kaaba and the tribe that was in charge of the sacred precincts around the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque, the Kaaba and its surroundings, was known as the Quraysh. And they were the most respected tribe in Arabia at the time. Indeed, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, himself was from the Quraysh. The Quraysh was a large tribe and the Prophet وسلم, was from Bani Hashim which was a sub-tribe of the tribe of the Quraysh. However, the Quraysh collectively were in a state of despair about this message of the Prophet Muhammad. How can he make all the idols into one God? How can he make all of these into the worship of the one God? They imagined that if this happened and the idols were removed and the Kaaba was only to worship one God, 
who would come to the Kaaba, who would come to Mecca, who would perform pilgrimage. Actually, really what they had in their mind was their own material self-interest, not truth, not the reality of whether Muhammad was a prophet or not. This is not what they were interested in. In fact, one of the uncles of the Prophet Muhammad, he said, look, your tribe has looked after the pilgrims and our tribe looked after the pilgrims. Your tribe did this good action and our tribe did this good action. Now you say you are a prophet, how can we compete with this? In other words, he was admitting that his refusal to follow Islam was based purely upon his tribal allegiance. What a stumbling block to truth. What a disastrous path they were following. So they got together. What are we going to do? How are we going to combat this Quran? This amazing speech that enticed, that enchanted its listeners. So al Khama ibn Abdul Manaf, he said in a gathering of the Quraysh leaders, O oh Quraysh, a new calamity has befallen you. When Muhammad was a young man, he was the most liked among you, the most truthful in speech and the most trustworthy until when you saw the gray hairs on his temple, he brought you his message. You said, he's a sorcerer, he's a magician. But he is not. For we have seen such people and they're spitting and they're knots. You said he was a soothsayer. But we have seen those people and their behavior and we have heard their rhymes. And you said he's a poet. But he's not a poet. For what we, we know every type of poetry. You said he was possessed. And, but he's not possessed. We've seen the possessed people. And he shows no signs of their gasping and whispering and delirium. O oh, men of Quraysh, look to your affairs. For by Allah, a serious thing has befallen you. Well, the Quraysh didn't know what to say. They tried all types of different things. They called the Prophet a soothsayer. They call him a magician. They call him a poet. They call him possessed. But none of these things were sticking. People didn't believe it because when they met the Prophet Muhammad, they knew that oh, he wasn't like any of those things. So what they decided was that they were going to tell the people the magic of his speech turned a man away from his father, wife, brother, family, and tribe. This is what they said. And of course, in a sense, that was true. In a sense, the message that there is nothing worthy of worship except the one God was something very revolutionary, very different. It was something that separated the people who worshipped the one God from the people who worshipped others than the one God. So this is their claim. This is what they decided to say. The magic of his speech turned a man away from his father, his brother, his wife, his family. And then Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was one of the uncles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Lahab would wait on the roadways into Mecca in the Hajj season. Now the Hajj is the pilgrimage, the annual pilgrimage. And that Hajj has been going on for thousands of years, even before the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the Arabs used to make Hajj to Mecca. But the Hajj had become corrupted with idol worship over the years. But the people still used to come from all over Arabia to the Hajj, and this was the source of the wealth of the Quraysh, that of course they were so frightened that the message of Islam was going to destroy. I mean, as a side point, look how many people are going to Mecca today. <laughs> they didn't suffer because of it, did they? Anyway, he went Abu Lahab and he used to go and warn people. He used to say, watch out. Be careful of this man, Muhammad. You know, he's my nephew. I know. Don't listen to him. He's got this speech that if you listen to it, if you, even if you listen to it, you'll be fallen under its spell. Now there was a man. His name was Tufail ibn Amr. Now Tufail was the chief of the Dos tribe. He was the chief of a whole tribe. And he himself 
was a very distinguished poet. So he was an important man in society, the chief of his tribe. He was a poet and he was on his way to Hajj. And as he arrived in Mecca, he was accosted by one of these Meccans telling him all these stories, warning him, said Muhammad this, Muhammad that, watch out for this man. He's so dangerous, you have to watch out for him. So this is what they were saying. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of his story after the break. Don't go away. Come back, listen to us, listen to this amazing story of Tufail ibn Amr and how he became Muslim by listening to the Quran. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone, welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And today we're talking about the stories of those people who heard the Quran and how it influenced them and affected them. And today we're talking about Tufail ibn Amr, the chief of the Dos tribe, who he was on his way to make Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. And the Quraysh, the leaders of the Quraysh, were waiting for him. They were waiting, telling the people, don't listen to Muhammad. His magic of his speech is going to make you go mad and turn you away from everything that you know and you love. So this is his story. He says, I approached Mecca. As soon as the Quraysh leaders saw me, they came up to me and gave me a most hearty welcome and accommodated me in a grand house. Sean knew how to look after people. Their leaders and notables then gathered and said, Oh, Tufail, you have come to our town. And this man, he claims he's a prophet, has ruined our authority. Notice, he's ruined our authority and shattered our community. We are afraid that he would succeed in undermining you and your authority and your community, just as he has done with us. Don't speak to the man. On no account listen to anything he has to say. He has the speech of a wizard, causing division between father and son, between brother and brother, between husband and wife. And they kept on telling me the most fantastic stories and scared me by recounting tales of his incredible deeds. I made up my mind then not to approach this man or speak to him or listen to anything he had to say. The following morning, I went to the place of worship, went to the Kaaba and made tawaf around the Kaaba as an act of worship to the idols that we made pilgrimage to and glorified. I put cotton in my ears out of fear that something of the speech of Muhammad might affect me. As soon as I entered the place of worship, I saw him standing near the Kaaba. He saw the Prophet Muhammad standing near the Kaaba. He was praying in a fashion which was different from our prayer. His whole manner of worship was different. The scene captivated me. His worship made me tremble and I felt drawn to him despite myself until I was quite close to him. Notwithstanding the precaution I had taken, God willed that some of what he was saying reached my hearing and I said to myself, what are you doing to fail? You are a perceptive poet. You can distinguish between the good and the bad in the poetry. What prevents you from listening? to what this man is saying. If what comes from him is good, accept it. And if it's bad, reject it. I remained there until the prophet left for his home. I followed him and he entered his home and I entered also and I said, Oh Muhammad, your people have said certain things about you to me. By God, they kept frightening me with these things and keeping away from your message until I block my ears to keep out your words. Despite this, God caused me to hear something of it and I found it good. So tell me more about your mission. The Prophet wasallam told Tufail about the mission and Tufail said, and then he recited to me Surat Al-Falaq. And he said, I swear by God, I have never heard such beautiful words before. I had never heard such beautiful words before. 
neither was a more noble mission ever described to me. Thereupon I stretched out my hand to him in allegiance and testified that there was none worthy of worship except the one God and that Muhammad was truly the messenger of God. And that's how I entered the religion of Islam. Even the leaders of the Quraysh were unable to desist themselves from hearing the Quran. To fail, heard the Quran, and as I said, he heard it and he became Muslim. But actually, even the leaders of the Quraysh, they were unable to desist and to resist. In fact, according to the seerah, or the biography of Ibn Ishaq, he mentions one incident when Abu Sufyan, who was one of the leaders of the Quraysh, and Abu Jahal and Abu Akhnas, they sneaked out of their houses in the night to listen to the Prophet reciting the Quran, hiding in their places until dawn. They sneaked out of them and they stayed listening to the Quran until the dawn, hiding. And on the way home, they bumped into each other and they reproached one another saying, don't you ever do that again. For if one of the weak-minded fools sees you, it will arouse suspicion in their minds. So they all promised. But this happened three nights in a row. Three nights in a row, they snuck out to listen to the Prophet reciting the Quran and again they bumped into each other until they took a totally solemn oath. They swore that they would never do it again. This is the question, my dear listeners, that I want you to put to yourself. How is it possible for an unlettered and unlearned man, not versed in poetry, to be able to produce a work of unrivaled eloquence and perfect rhetoric, so that even the assembled experts and masters of all the forms of poetry in the Arabic language were unable to produce the like of its smallest chapter. Indeed, they chose to fight the Prophet rather than meet this challenge. The flower of the nobility were killed, their trade and reputation destroyed. How could they choose this rather than count the verses of the Quran? Let us look at another story. This is the story of Omar ibn al-Khattab. He became one of the strongest defenders of Islam. But before that, he was one of the most violent enemies against the Muslims. He took it upon himself to physically abuse and attack the Muslims. And things became so bad for the Muslims that they were forced to flee. And this was something unheard of. That people should flee their own tribes, that they should flee their own people, because the Arabian society was held together by tribalism. But the Muslims were fleeing their own tribes and they fled to go and live in Abyssinia. And when this happened, Omar really began to think about things. And he was really unhappy about it. And the more he thought about it, the more unhappy he got. Until one day he decided, I am going to kill Muhammad. I've had enough. He took his sword and he was on his way to kill the Prophet Muhammad. But on the way, he met one of the people who had become Muslim secretly. And he said to him, where are you going Omar with your sword drawn like that? He said, I'm on my way to kill Muhammad. So he started to think, what can I do? And then he remembered that in fact the sister of Omar had already become Muslim. He said, you know what, before you deal with Muhammad, maybe you should deal with your own family first. He said, what do you mean? He said, your sister, she has become Muslim. So Omar was so infuriated. He was so mad. He changed direction, still with his sword drawn. He headed off to his sister's house. He arrived. And when he got to the door, he heard a noise that he had not heard before. He smashed down the door and there he found his sister and her husband reading something. She jumped up and he hit his sister and she fell on the floor and started to bleed. The sister of Omar said, okay, I have become Muslim. Do what you like with me. Kill me. I don't care. I've become Muslim. So what? And when Omar saw his sister lying there, bleeding and so vigorous and defending herself and not even afraid to die, 
he became, he calmed down. He said, my sister, what is that that you are reading? She said, they are the verses of the Quran, the speech of God, the words of Allah. He said, let me see it. She said, no, not until you wash yourself first. So she made Umar wash his hands so he could not touch the paper of the Quran without washing himself. And then he sat down and he began to read. And as he read, and as he read, and as he read, the Quran began to enter his heart. He put the Quran down and he went off. He went to the place where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. Where is Muhammad? He said. Their people were saying, Muhammad, it is Umar. He has come. The Prophet said, let him in. Umar came. He said, O oh Muhammad, I testify and bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except the one God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And this is how one of the strongest and most vigorous opponents of Islam, Umar, became one of the most strongest and vigorous defenders of Islam. And he is famous until today for his justice and for his piety and for his standing up for the truth. It's another story of another person who embraced Islam just from hearing the beautiful words of the Quran. How much more do you need in order to be convinced that Islam is the truth? You need to hear more stuff? Well, there is more. Join us in our next episode for more amazing evidences of the divine origin of the Quran and for the proof that Islam is the truth. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.